Good morning, everybody. This morning, I want to read Psalm 119, it's verses 33 through 37. Teach me, Lord, the way of your decrees, that I may follow it to the end. Give me understanding, so that I may keep your law and obey it with all my heart. Direct me in the path of your commands, for there I will find delight. Turn my heart toward your statues and not toward selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. For the past few months, I felt God's calling to share a difficult subject for me. I was planning just to write it up to share it with my sons, but when I shared it with Pastor Bullard, he asked me to share it here. And I've learned when you say yes to God, you better have your seatbelt on because it can be quite a ride. I want to tell you a story about a man that I met that helped turn me back to God. But the interesting thing is, is I don't know the man's name. I never talked to him. I probably saw him for less than two or three minutes, and I don't think he ever knew who I was either. But to get to that point, I'm going to have to tell you how I got there and how I met him. I grew up what some would probably call Amish or Mennonite. Um, We had black cars, no television, no radios, no musical instruments. Um, I had to wear suspenders and drab clothes, a button-down shirt. My mom and sisters wore a cap on their head and homemade dresses. And when I was two, we moved to a very, very rural part of West Virginia and went to a little one-room school, eighth grades in one room. And that's what my earliest memories really are. When I was nine, I was probably had two brothers lived in this little house up in the mountains and at night I would hear a voice calling me it would say Jens follow me and I didn't know what it was this went on for about a week I even asked my brothers do you hear that they're like no I don't hear anything so kind of reminds me of um, 1 Samuel 310 the Lord came and stood calling at other times Samuel Samuel and Samuel said speak for your servant hears well I didn't know what it was So I went to my parents and told them what was happening. And they said, oh, that's God talking to you. He wants you to live for him. So they explained the plan of salvation to me. And I gave my life to him. And I was very, very happy. I remember telling my younger sister about it the next day. And she was too young to understand. But I just had to tell somebody. So I asked my parents, what do I do next? And they said, read the Bible. God gives you the instructions. So I was very excited about this, and I started reading from Matthew and read through the Bible. And when I came to Acts 2.38, it says, Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So I realized that the next step was to be baptized. And I was excited about this. So I went to my parents and showed them the Scripture. And they looked at me and said, well, you can't do that yet. I said, why not? And they said, well, in our culture here, you have to be 14 years old at least, and you have to join the church when you become baptized, so that's why you have to wait. I remember arguing with them a lot. I said, the Bible says I need to be baptized, and you're telling me I can't. And they said, nope, it's just not an option. So it really shook my young faith to have to be listening to that. But... I decided to wait. And when I was about 12, we moved back to Pennsylvania, a different part of Pennsylvania. And um, it was a very tumultuous time in my life. Um, I didn't realize until I was in my 30s that my dad was she cheating with a lady in town. And that was one of the reasons we moved and why he was things were really messed up when we moved. But I got older. And when I reached 14, I said, OK, now I want to be baptized. And so at that point in our church, you would go to at least three months of classes to learn how to become a member of the church. It was more focused on that than actually being baptized. And I went through the three months and listened to all the rules, and I was becoming very, very uncomfortable with joining the church that had all these rules that weren't in the Bible. So just before I was supposed to be baptized, I told the bishop of the church, I said, I need to wait. I got to think about this more. And he told my dad. My dad became very, very upset at me because it made him look bad because I wasn't following the traditional steps of our church. 
So I waited another year and still felt the pressure that I needed to become baptized. It's just the struggle between looking at all the rules. Every time I'd read about the scribes and Pharisees, I'd think about, they're similar to our church. They have all these rules and everything has to be done right, and then you're okay. Just wasn't comfortable with it, but finally I said, okay, i got to be baptized. So I became baptized and became a member of the church. But very quickly after I joined the church, I was soon marked as a rebellious teenager. I remember one time I went on a kayak trip, and the kayak dumped over and I got wet and I was in my full Amish gear with suspenders and everything. And my suspenders got wet and stretched out and I took them off. And we walked up into a little convenience store to get lunch and someone from the church saw me there and they reported me to the bishop and I was in a lot of trouble just for not wearing suspenders. So I was put on what's called proving. Proving was one step before excommunication. And in excommunication, it would mean that they basically, the church would commit your soul to the devil. And also, you couldn't sit and eat with your family. There was lots of consequences. It was dire. I had an uncle that was excommunicated, and I saw how badly he was treated. I was 16 years old. I was unproving, almost excommunicated. And the church actually made a big circle around me. And so all the men and women, probably 100 people, a big circle around me, and they sang hymns at me that they felt were to bring me back to God. And it was a very scarring experience to this day. I really, really can't listen to old hymns. They just bring back terrible memories. And it was really hard for me because I saw other people who broke the rules, and if they weren't caught, they were okay. I was just the one who I didn't want to hide things. So, But after this, I learned you better hide things if you weren't going to follow the rules. And it was not a good experience. I was very disillusioned with Christianity and pretty much felt that God must not be real if this is what Christians were. And at this point in our culture there, you worked for your dad or for someone else in the church and you gave your dad all the money till you were 21 years old. So even at 18, I couldn't leave. It was pretty much a cult where you were forced to stay in. When I was 19, we moved to the Ukraine. And I wanted adventure and living in a former communist country, that fit the bill. So I was excited about this. We um, were delivering humanitarian aid to people who had lost everything due to inflation. Uh, In one year there, $2,000 in their money became worth $2. So it just wrecked everything. All the pensioners who suddenly were living very well, had no money at all, could barely afford to eat. And I was put in charge of warehousing and vehicle maintenance. While I was there, I was carjacked at knife point one time, made to drive a guy that was beaten badly by the mafia back to his house. Uh, Another time, I saw bodies being carried out of the mafia headquarters. Corruption was really rampant, and on my 21st birthday, I actually was thrown off a train on the border between um, the Ukraine and Poland and made to walk down a railroad track at midnight with an AK-47 poking my spine. That's a whole nother story. We brought our church rule book with us to the Ukraine, and I watched as the church asked the women to wear a special kind of stockings that you could only buy in the U.S. It just made absolutely no sense to me that we were shipping stockings over to these women that they could wear so that they could follow our rule book. And we also had to ship over a special kind of jacket for the men because neither one of them were available there. So I was still very, very disillusioned with everything. Um, I was actually asked to preach there every four weeks, and I did. Um, Just basic, simple gospel, and the church people there thought it was wonderful, and they kept telling me I was going to be a pastor, but I felt very fake and hollow on the inside. I was just really angry at Christians and how it didn't make sense. But while I was there, I got to travel a lot and started meeting the unregistered Baptists or the former underground church who, during communism, was persecuted and jailed for their faith. And their love for God really got my attention. It was just the joy that they had in living freedom in Christ was unbelievable. James 1, 2-4 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance. 
Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. These people were so happy to meet and do public baptisms. I remember seeing the joy on their faces when they were baptizing people in the streams there and just the sheer pleasure they had from that. Because after decades of persecution, they just loved their freedom. The other thing that impressed me with them is um, Christmas was important, but Easter was a really, really big holiday. They would have large groups of people together in big banquets. And I asked them why, and they said, well, Christmas was when Christ was born. That was a gift. But when he died for us on the cross and saved us from our sins, that is a reason to celebrate. So even months after Easter, if you wouldn't have seen someone before Easter, you always wished them a happy Easter. And that's always had an impression on me on how the importance of Easter was to them. So after I was there a while, one day I went with a load of supplies and an interpreter, because my Russian wasn't that good, to deliver rice and beans to a former underground pastor for him to distribute. I was unloading the truck and the um, interpreter went inside to find him. And he came out and I just remember seeing him basically walk from the house to the building I was unloading. I don't think he even said hi to me because he was doing so many different things. He was in his late seventies probably. But what got my attention is his face glowed. And it wasn't a glow like I'm so happy to see all the rice and beans or I'm happy to see you. It was like there was a light bulb in his head. Later on, I realized it's like Exodus 34, 29. And when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands, he was unaware that his face had become radiant from speaking with the Lord. There was... I don't know if unless you've seen it in an experience that I, I can't really describe it, but it had a huge impact on me. And after we left, the interpreter, who was also very touched by this guy, told me his story. He had been a prisoner of war during World War II. I think from what I understand, he was in, in World War II Nazi prison for three years. If you look at history and you look at how the Nazis treated the Soviet prisoners, it's actually amazing that he's even alive. Starvation, forced labor, that was normal. Mass executions, long forced marches. I was looking at photos of how they were treated, and it was unbelievable. Just large fields in the winter, just kept outside. No clothes to keep them warm, and it's minimum food to keep them going. But he survived this, came back to the Ukraine, and became a pastor of the underground church. Stalin at that point hated the underground, unregistered church so much because he couldn't control it. He couldn't make him do what he wanted. The um, Orthodox church was fine because the leaders were all part of the Communist Party, but these people weren't. So since he wouldn't give up his faith, this man was imprisoned for being a pastor, and he was sent to Siberia for 10 years. Now here's the part that I still struggle with understanding he told the interpreter that German prisons were like heaven compared to Soviet prisons. So I'm thinking about this. Starvation, forced labor, mass executions, long forced marches were like heaven compared to the Siberian gulags. It's just really, really hard to imagine. And 10 years of that. The little bit of research I can find, because the Soviets worked very, very hard on hiding these prisons and how they were treated, then the information, it's, it's unspeakable. You can't even imagine it. So after 10 years, he was finally released, but he still wouldn't give up being a Christian. So the secret police would visit him every week and beat he and his wife. Their children would actually come down in the morning to find their parents in pools of blood on the floor. After a while, when that wasn't working, what they would do is they would make them lie on their stomachs, bend their knees up, and they would beat them on the bottom of their feet. Because then if they, there was not evidence to the world around them, they were being beaten. But it was still incredibly painful and made it hard for them to walk. And this continued most of the rest of his life because they were trying to get him to give up his Christianity and being a pastor. So the rest of the trip home with that interpreter, after hearing that story, I was really quiet because it really, really shook me. 
If God was so real to this man that he could live through this and still radiate his love, Christianity had to be real. And after thinking about it a lot, I rededicated my life to God again and worked in finding his will for me, all because of the story of this man and all he went through. And just seeing, like I said, his face glowed. So a few months after that, I was hit on the head with a bread bag half full of sand out of a 14-story apartment building. I was helping people move out of an apartment, and kids were throwing stuff out just to be kids, I guess. And it hit me on the left side of my head and cracked my skull, gave me a really severe concussion, actually compressed my spine. I lost part of my memory and um, actually had to relearn some motor skills again. Doctors said I should have been killed. It, it said that there's no, normally someone doesn't survive something like that and actually being able to function. And it took years for me to get some functions back again. But I knew from that experience that God had left me on this earth for a reason. And I set out to find his plan for me. Because I've discovered that sometimes following God doesn't have to be a glamorous leader or pastor or and not that they always have glamorous jobs but in a place where people notice you sometimes it's just getting up in the morning and saying god what's next i'm ready to do it and that was what i learned out of this experience after he left me here because my calling was not a great and glorious calling it was just to walk with him every day but I've been thinking about what would have happened if this man that I met, like I said, I don't even know his name. It you know, probably was Sergei because that's one of the most common names there. But what would have happened if he would have given up his faith, let's say, in the Nazi prisons? What if he would have given up his faith from all the beatings or the Siberian prisons? He wouldn't have had that love that showed through his face and a story to share story that affected me because i don't think without hearing his story you know who knows but i'm not sure i'd be a christian to this day because of all the other terrible things that i saw christians do and call it being a christian but you know like i said since he let his love for god permeate his body and glow he affected me you know, honestly, deep down inside, I think if he knew, he would do it all over again. And I have a feeling he's in heaven. He was very old when I met him. And he probably knows now. But this is my challenge, and it honestly scares me to think about it. Would I spend my life in prison or get weekly beatings or other hardships to bring a life to Christ? And a lot of us would like to think, yes, we'd do that. If we could see people coming to Christ because of all we're going through, we'd be willing to do that. Um, and I hope so, and I like to think I would. But here's the harder part. What if I never knew that it would change a life? Would I be willing to do it anyway just because of my love to God? Because this man's hardships turned him to the closest thing to Jesus I've ever seen. What am I letting my really small hardships do? Because when I study the world and how it works and how amazing things, how amazing how many things take pressure, storms, and other hardships to become beautiful. The Grand Canyon's beauty comes from rushing water and erosion. When I go down to the Palador, I look at all that beauty and realize that didn't come just naturally. I mean, yes, naturally, but there was torrents of water moving through there. There was wind forming those things, and it wasn't easy on that. Without friction, we don't see beauty. Diamonds come from extreme pressure. A sword can't be made without heat and beating with a hammer. And often as Christians, we cannot be who God needs us to be without shaping and heat. Here in the U.S., as Christians, we often think a good Christian is going to have a, be a successful person, has a nice house, a successful career, ties generously from their largesse of funds, and is active in the church. 
And these are often held up as pillars in the church, and I'm not knocking that. But what about the person who has lost loved ones, lost jobs, been bankrupt, and generally not successful? Does God allow that so that they can become out a stronger Christian? Sometimes I think God allows trials just to strengthen us. And I'm pretty sure that he does. Because when we look through the Bible and we look to see how the many times when you look at Job and how it made his relationship stronger with God, it's amazing how he creates our path. We're going through really interesting times right now as a world right now. We've seen what tyrant leaders do when they get a little bit of power with the pandemic going on. A lot of us had our jobs or businesses affected by the pandemic. And as we're going through this, my challenge is, can we embrace the challenge of what God has for us? Can we let it turn us into the men God needs us to affect this world? So I want to close with this verse, Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So when we embrace that God's purpose is good no matter what it seems like, it will be much easier to let his light shine through our lives. I'm going to close in prayer. Dear God, I just thank you for, thank you for the trials. It's very, makes me afraid to say that sometimes, but you form our lives into what you want us to be by allowing trials in our lives. And I just pray for all those Christians around the world who are going through trials and being persecuted for their faith. And I also pray for us here that we don't let those little things stop us from sharing your love, but that the world around us can see your love. And that you would help us to remember that even if we don't see how it affects other people, that your love needs to shine constantly through our lives. Let's call this in your name. Amen.